Welcome to uh, class 28 of topics in power electronics and distributed generation. Uh, we have been uh, uh, looking at uh, the common mode and differential mode analysis of uh, a power converter and uh, the differential mode signals are quite important because they are primarily responsible for power transfer. So, the basic purpose for operating the power converter is power transfer. So, the study of the differential mode operation of it is an uh, important part. The common mode signals are important when you are looking at uh, uh, other perspectives such as uh, circulating possibility for circulating currents in the converter, uh, possibility uh, the EMI uh, uh, characteristics, EMI perspective of the power converter. Uh, the other thing we saw in the last class is that uh, the common mode and differential mode analysis can be performed on, a, uh, on using both the switching model and the averaging model, average model. And uh, if you look, uh, look at a single phase uh, inverter, so this is a single phase two leg converter. Earlier we had looked at a single phase uh, center tap capacitor converter. So, you could look at it from the common mode and differential mode analysis and look at what uh, how the, the circuits would behave. In particular for the two leg converter, we looked at uh, a, mo a modulation method where you are, swi you are switching both legs of the power converter. Because now you have two legs, there are a lot of possibilities for the way in which you could now have PWM uh, uh, on the two legs, uh, the method that we looked at, uh, the, uh, the modulation method one, uh, where we had the duty cycle for uh, leg A and duty cycle for leg B to be uh, symmetric around 0 0.5 and uh, uh, if you look at uh, the, uh, the DA and DB, essentially they are sy symmetric around 0 0.5. And the characteristics that we saw is effectively the output frequency uh, is doubled. So, you have two pulses coming in the output uh, for ev during every switching period. You also have the polarity of the output pulses uh, being in the uh, polarity of the commanded voltage that you would like. So, we call this unipolar uh, modulation. If you have pulses of both polarity coming during the operation that would be a bipolar modulation. We look at a couple of uh, other possibilities for, uh, uh, for the way in which you could modulate the power converter. Here both legs are switching. Uh, one possible method for modulating the power converter could be that uh, you could switch say leg A at high frequencies. When you want to get a positive output voltage, uh, you could say you could uh, you could turn on uh, say uh, this particular device. So if this particular device is on, like B would be connected to the negative DC bus. So using VDC, you could synthesize a positive voltage. Uh, if you want to synthesize a negative voltage, you could turn on this particular leg, and and uh, uh, switch uh, the leg A. So, because now leg B is connected to positive, you have minus VDC and uh, by appropriately switching leg A, you could synthesize a negative uh, polarity output voltage. So, you could do this by considering signals. So, we will consider uh, a modulation method 2. So, if you your leg B is modulated at the fundamental frequency which is 50 hertz in our case and if our desired output voltage uh, has uh, was of the form A V cos omega t. then essentially what we would have is db could be a signal which would be 0 uh, 
if V O star is positive and 1 if V O star is uh, negative. Uh, so, if you look at uh, the switching signals, the switching functions for leg B, your S B S B plus would be a signal of the form uh, 1 if V O star is less than 0 and 0 otherwise. So, essentially your leg B is switching at fundamental frequency and leg A is switching at the carrier frequency. So, if you look at the, uh, uh, the duty cycle signals that are being applied for leg A, we have d A is equal to and 1 plus A V by V D C cos omega t otherwise. Again uh, your leg B uh, uh, the D B was going between 0 and plus 1 with not taking any values in between whereas, now D A is having a value which goes between uh, depending on the polarity of your output voltage that you would like to synthesize, it takes on signals. Be, uh, so, because your D A is now a continuous uh, a signal between 0 and 1, your S A plus switching function uh, transitions occur at F S W. If you look at uh, uh, V A B on a differential mode, uh, essentially the output uh, signals will have uh, if you look at your, your D B, D B is now switching at uh, the fundamental frequency. So, this is time in milliseconds. So, it is uh, so one fundamental frequency would correspond to a duration of 20 milliseconds. Uh, D A what we had written the expression would now have a form which looks like this red dotted line and uh, the, um, the height of this particular D A uh, signal would depend on the amplitude of your A C signal that you are trying to synthesize. So, if you then uh, zoom in to some region of uh, your P W M operation, uh, say in this particular between 15 and uh, say 20 milliseconds, you would have waveforms uh, that look like this. S B plus is now just uh, staying low. Uh, your S A plus would now be switching between plus 0 and plus 1 depending on the amplitude of this D A signal. And you can see that your effective output frequency is now F S W. So, you lose the advantage of 2 F S W that you had in the previous modulation case. You have now your effective output switching frequency which, uh, uh, which is at uh, F S W rather than 2 F S W. If you, so, if you, you can actually write an expression for V uh, differential mode of your output. is V D C into S A plus minus S B plus. So, you can see that uh, uh, despite the uh, slightly more complex shape of uh, uh, S A plus and uh, S B plus, your effective output voltage would be the desired sinusoid. If you look at your common mode signals that we had, we, we wrote an expression for V common mode of your input which was V D C into 
half minus S B plus. So, you can see that now because your S B plus has a shape uh, 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 it is 0 in the regions say 0 to 5 seconds it would be high between 5 and 15. Your S B plus function is now uh, switching at the fundamental frequency. So, if you look at your common mode signal that is coming in your output you are jumping between plus V D C by 2 and minus V D C by 2 at your fundamental frequency which is much lower than your uh, switching frequency which means that your uh, high frequency transitions which would cause uh, spikes of current to flow into the ground is occurring at a much lower repetition rate. So, your expected problems of EMI with this particular modulation method could be lower than with the modulation method 1 that we uh, previously saw, uh, discussed. So, it could be easier to build a uh, EMI filter. Uh, uh, so, the EMI issues is not just about the topology it is also related to how you are actually uh, conducting the switching operations. So, if you now look at uh, the option that we had uh, looked at, we were uh, switching leg B at uh, the fundamental uh, frequency and we switched leg A at high frequency. We could also do uh, take a different uh, uh, alternative approach where we switch leg B at uh, the switching frequency and we, we could switch leg A at the fundam fundamental frequency. So, uh, we will call that modulation method 3. star is positive. So, this would correspond to S A plus being equal to 1 and 0 otherwise and your d b for the other leg would be 1 minus A v by V d c uh, cos omega t. if u star positive or minus a v again you can see uh, because your v o uh, output voltage is v d c into d a minus d b you get the same differential mode output signal in all the three uh, modulation methods. So, the differential mode signals would not change. Uh, if you look at the, the shape of the waveforms, in the modulation method 3, you can see that now d a is now switching at uh, the fundamental frequency and d b is now having a value which lies in between uh, 0 and plus 1 which means that d b will be switching at higher frequencies. Uh, so, s b plus is the one which is switching and s a a plus is now staying uh, at 0. Say if you are looking at maybe a zoomed in region around there it would correspond to waveforms that has been drawn below. If you look at your common mode signal in this particular case we, we can we, we have v c m of your input is V d c into half minus S b plus. In this case we can see that uh, your input would see high frequency on the common mode. So, we have problems with the, the high frequency on uh, your input side. You also have now only uh, uh, F s w as your output equivalent switching frequency which means that we lost the advantage of 2 f s w. So, we can see that uh, 
uh, this uh, so uh, your differential mode signals V d m out is still the same V d c into S a plus minus S b plus. So, your output switching frequency is still at uh, uh, F s w. So, modulation method 3 is poor from both the input and output perspective. So, you uh, by not being careful about which leg you are switching at the appropriate rate, you could end up with uh, uh, exacerbating the problems that you are facing in your power converter uh, without getting any advantage uh, either at the input or at the output. So, one thing that uh, also to keep in mind is that uh, we were looking at it uh, at the operation of this power converter from uh, the input and output voltage waveform basis. Another important factor to keep in mind is uh, how these legs of the power converter would operate on a thermal basis. If you are switching say one leg at F s w at the carrier frequency and the other leg at fundamental frequency, it means that one leg is having higher losses and the other leg is having lower losses. So, from a thermal loading perspective, the temperature rise on one leg would be more and uh, uh, compared to the other leg. So, if you are using a H bridge module, you may not be fully utilizing your semiconductors. So, you will have to look at all the factors in mind depend uh, to look at uh, what are the advantages and disadvantages of one particular topology or one particular method of uh, uh, op operating your switches in a power converter. So, now that we have uh, uh, looked at this uh, two leg power converter, we could ask a similar question uh, as we did for our uh, center tapped capacitor topology of uh, what would be the, the, the design issues behind uh, the DC bus capacitor for this particular topology. Uh, how does it compare with the uh, center tab uh, capacitor topology. So, uh, we will look at uh, this design uh, uh, with the same example as what we uh, looked at in for a center tab capacitor. So, we will consider a 2 kilowatt 230 volt unity power factor power converter, but now with a single phase two leg inverter topology modulating with method 1. Okay. And we will assume that your, your switching frequency is 10 kilohertz, your carrier frequency is 10 kilohertz. So, your effective switching frequency seen by your filters would be at uh, 20 kilohertz. The ambient temperature and the operation of the power converter is uh, uh, kept the same. So, we know that uh, from our average model for the power converter V a b is d a minus d b times V d c and uh, uh, d a is uh, half plus m cos omega t by 2, d b is uh, uh, again symmetric about the 0.5 point. So, V a b can be written as uh, m V d c uh, cos omega t and uh, if we are trying to synthesize a 230 volt uh, AC output, you are talking about V d c of the order of uh, 325 volt for V, v o is 230 volts uh, uh, RMS. Again we have to consider factors such as the uh, grid voltage variation. Uh, dead band on state drops in the devices etcetera. So, we will consider 5 percent for V a c variation and dead band effects. and uh, 10 percent drop for filtered. So, the actual DC bus voltage uh, that we might need to use would be higher. So, it would be of the order of 400 volts rather than 
325 volts with ideally. So, so again for the selection of the capacitors we are talking about uh, capacitors which are rated at uh, four higher than 400 volts maybe 450 volts would be a suitable choice. So, we will consider uh, uh, we'll, so, for our analysis we'll, we could do a similar analysis uh, for the power converter. Uh, we could match the, the power flow between the input and output of the, uh, of the power converter. So, if, if we take a single leg converter. Uh, we looked at your P out and we looked at the power flow in to evaluate the, the DC current and the 100 hertz ripple that would be seen by the uh, DC bus capacitors. We could do a similar uh, analysis uh, to evaluate what would be the 100 hertz ripple on the DC bus. So, we have VDC times I p of t which is the positive DC bus current we will call it I d C p. So, we know your the AC voltage is 230 volts, we know the power is 2 kilowatts. So, we know what our A i is. So, you could calculate I d C p So, this is a DC current that flows through at which has a value of A v A i by 2 v D C and there is a 100 hertz component that is flowing through which would have a RMS value of A V A I by 2 root 2 V D C. So, the next component that we would uh, we would like to evaluate for this particular power converter is uh, uh, due to the switching operation what is the high frequency components that now flow through the DC bus capacitor and you could evaluate the high frequency components by looking again at the switching functions. So, if you have S A plus to have a shape such as this and S B plus to have a shape such as this and you have your I out when S A plus is uh, uh, wider than S B plus then this particular point uh, this region in between uh, the width of this region would be equal to D A times uh, T S and the width of this particular duration is D B times T S W T S W and then you could calculate what is the average of this particular uh, uh, DC bus uh, positive current and what is the RMS value. Your average current would then be equal to is I out to D A minus D B. Again depending on the polarity of I out it could be uh, positive or negative. Your RMS uh, quantity on a per switching cycle basis would be magnitude of I out into square root of the magnitude of D A minus D B. So, again this is this gives the RMS value on uh, uh, per uh, switching duration per T S W you could then sum it over all the switching durations in one fundamental cycle to calculate your high frequency RMS currents. Uh, 
for a switching frequency of 10 kilohertz and uh, your TSW is 100 microseconds and F, your fundamental frequency is 50 hertz. So, you have number of points per fundamental is 20 milliseconds by 100 microseconds. So, that would give you 200 points. So, your high frequency current So, this is I out of N T S and the whole thing under square root will give you your RMS current. So, essentially you are summing up the RMS over all the uh, uh, switching uh, 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 TSWs. So, we could then ask a similar question as what we did for our uh, DC bus uh, capacitor midpoint uh, topology of what is the RMS currents, what would be the voltage ripple, what would be the the power dissipation, temperature rise, the number of capacitors you need to uh, place in parallel and we could then uh, for the particular uh, this particular example, we will consider the same capacitor as what we considered for the uh, for the uh, previous topology. So, we will uh, assume a 450 volt 150 microfarad capacitor with uh, the given ESR of 0.8 ohms at uh, 100 kilohertz. Uh, we will assume the data to be uh, is the same as what we had the previous time. We will assume that the, the high frequency current uh, multiplier is, a, a, uh, is 1.4 amps even at 20 kilohertz. Uh, we had taken 1.4 amps at 10 kilohertz. We will assume that it stays flat even at uh, 20 kilohertz and uh, the data is same as what we considered for the DC bus capacitor midpoint topology. So, essentially uh, 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 the, the, the current multipliers as we saw gives information about the ESR of the capacitor as a function of frequency. So, uh, if uh, in this particular topology, we, we know that it is 0.8 ohms uh, ESR at 100 hertz and your current at 100 hertz is 1 amp. So, I square r is 1 square into 0.8. Uh, so, the ESR at 20 kilohertz into 1.4 amps square, one would be able to calculate the ESR which. Uh, so, this turns out to have a value of 0 0.41 ohms. So, for this particular power converter, it is 2 kilowatts, uh, 230 volts. So, your current rating IAC is 2 kilowatts, 230 volts. So, this corresponds to 8.7 amps RMS uh, or 12.3 amps peak. Uh, in this topology, because the, the output is not connected to the capacitor through any midpoints, there will be no 50 hertz component. So, the low frequency component is the 100 hertz component. So, your IDCP of T is now 
uh, 1 by 400 which is your DC bus voltage into 230 root 2 cos omega t into 12.3 which is the current cos omega t uh, assuming unity power factor of operation. So, your IDC, P, uh, IDC average DC current is 5 amps and your IDC P at uh, 100 hertz is uh, 5 amps peak which would correspond to 3.54 amps RMS. So, to evaluate your high frequency component of the current, uh, we will uh, we can calculate it in a similar manner as what we have just discussed. Uh, we know our I out of at N T S W is 12.3 cos and we are using modulation method 1. So, d a of n t s is 0.5 plus your output voltage is uh, having a peak value of uh, uh, 230 root 2. So, this is 325. So, you have your duty cycles and your currents based on which you could now uh, calculate what is your uh, high frequency current flowing in your DC bus and uh, that current now would be 2 pulses uh, per uh, uh, TSW. So, you are having your DC bus current also now at uh, 20 uh, kilohertz and its uh, side bands and harmonics. So, uh, based on the expression that we had just uh, writ uh, written previously, you could calculate your ICDC at 20 kilohertz is uh, uh, 3.83 amps. So, if you look at your total RMS current flowing through the capacitor, it would now be your 100 hertz component plus your uh, 20 kilohertz component. So, you have uh, about 5.2 amps uh, flowing through the DC bus capacitor and uh, this uh, so a single capacitor would obviously not be sufficient and uh, we would have to connect uh, multiple capacitors in parallel. So, so if you look at the ESR numbers, uh, the ESR at uh, 100 hertz. and at 20 kilohertz is 0 0.41 ohms and uh, based on the calculations from our pre previous example, we saw that the cap capacitor which was specified for 3000 hours of life uh, would correspond to a core temperature T core of uh, 
degree centigrade and it had a thermal impedance from core to ambient uh, of 12.3 degree uh, centigrade per watt. So, this is from the previous example. Uh, so, using this ESR numbers we could calculate what is the effective 100 hertz current that is flowing through the capacitor. So, uh, effective 100 hertz current So, 3.54 is the 100 hertz ripple plus uh, 3.83 is the switching frequency ripple. So, so your I 100 is 4.47 amps. So, from a thermal perspective, uh, we had seen again from the data sheet that if we have about 2 amps per capacitor and it is operating at an ambient of 55 degree centigrade, you can expect about 3000 hours of life. Uh, so, if we can make use of this number by taking the 2 amps per capacitor uh, uh, as, the, as a design guideline, we would need We need, so you are talking about uh, roughly 3 capacitors. Uh, so, last time we did an in the previous example an analysis with both 3 and 4 capacitors, we will consider say for uh, 4 capacitors in this case as being used in the design. So, select 4 capacitors. So, if we could then calculate the power loss uh, per capacitor so this is 0 0.8 into So, it is about 1 watt loss per capacitor. Uh, so, 4 capacitors in parallel we are talking about 4 watts uh, loss in the bank. Your core temperature for the capacitor is 50 into 50 plus 50 is the ambient within the cabinet plus 1 watt loss per capacitor into 12.3 which is the thermal impedance and degrees per watt. So, you have a core temperature of 62.3 degrees centigrade and again assuming the simple thermal uh, lifetime model, you are considering 3000 into talking about 9.8 years uh, compared to about 4.5 years for the other uh, uh, in the previous example. Uh, we could also calculate the voltage ripple. Uh, 
So, your capacitor bank is there is 4 capacitors in parallel 150 microfarads. So, this is 600 microfarads. So, your 100 hertz ripple is So, you have about 13.3 volts as your 100 hertz ripple uh, and then you could look at what is the ripple at uh, 20 kilohertz. So, we had 3.83 amps again we will assume that this it is actually square pulses, but assuming it is a, a sinusoid you will have 3.83 times root 2. These are all simplifications to get an estimate of what the ripple is. So, it is about uh, 70 uh, millivolts. So, it is uh, almost negligible the ripple at 20, 20 kilohertz. This is a capacitive ripple. If you look at the ripple because of the ESR, you are talking about 3.83 root 2 into 0 0.41 is the ESR at 20 kilohertz and there are 4 capacitors in parallel. So, you are talking about 0.55 volts. So, you can see at uh, the switching frequency your capacitor bank is now acting uh, more resistive than capacitive. So, uh, you have the same concerns that you have had in the previous topology you need to uh, if you have strain inductances you need you will have strain inductances and you need to put uh, uh, snubber capacitors uh, film capacitors in parallel uh, so as to account for the uh, rapid transitions that would be there in the current waveforms due to the switching of the transistors so we could look at then a comparison of uh, uh, the two leg uh, uh, inverter topology with the center tapped uh, uh, capacitor topology. And uh, if you look at uh, the, the center tapped capac capacitor topology, one thing is you need lesser semiconductor because you have only one leg, uh, whereas in the two leg case you would have two legs. So, so, you have an additional uh, leg uh, semiconductors to consider, but one thing is uh, the semiconductors are rated in this particular case for 1200 volts, the other case the semiconductors might be rated for 600 volts. So, the voltage rating is not identical. In the center tap uh, case you have more capacitors uh, that you would need in your capacitor bank. So, depending on the cost of your capacitors versus cost of a additional leg of, a, uh, uh, of semiconductor uh, you would have different initial costs. In this particular case you have fewer DC bus capacitors, but uh, it is not just the semiconductor leg you need to consider you need to also consider gate drives etcetera that you would need for uh, the leg. If you look at the path for uh, the uh, current flow uh, in the center tap topology your current would be flowing through one semiconductor device be it a transistor or a diode, then the return path is through the capacitor. So, you have losses due to the drops in those paths which could be the conduction drop and the drops in the ESR uh, of the capacitor. Uh, whereas, if you look at the losses in the case of the two leg con converter, you have uh, the drops in two semiconductor devices. Uh, 
and the capacitor. So, you will have to look at uh, from a uh, overall perspective whether uh, the losses would be more in one case or the other. It depends to, to a large extent on how much more dominant the capacitor ESR values are compared to the on state drops of semiconductor devices. However, uh, the low voltage rating of the semiconductors mean that uh, uh, the semiconductor drops over here would not be identical to the semiconductor drops over in the center tap topology. If you take a semiconductor device, when you go up in voltage rating, the on state uh, uh, resistance will go up uh, for a given current level. So, a 1200 volt device would have a higher R conduction compared to a 600 volt device. You uh, can also consider the effect of uh, uh, say in modulation method 1, uh, we saw that the effective uh, output frequency is twice the switching frequency. So, your ripple current in the output filter would be uh, lower because uh, of the higher equivalent frequency, which means that uh, potentially you could look at whether there is uh, some energy savings because of reduced ripple current in your output filter. Uh, from a reliability perspective, uh, the center tap topology has fewer semiconductor switches and gate drives. So, if your reliability issues are, are more, more with semiconductor devices, then uh, uh, one with fewer devices would be of advantage. Whereas, the two leg, capac uh, two -leg inverter has fewer capacitors and the voltage rating is reduced. So, your clearance requirement etcetera is actually reduced. So, depending on again which is the item of concern, you, you have uh, different reliability uh, implications of these two topologies. Also other factors, performance factors uh, we also we saw that in one case you have bipolar PWM, in one case you have unipolar PWM also the switching frequency is effectively doubled in modulation method 1. Uh, we also saw that in the center type topology, you have low frequency or DC essentially DC in your input common mode voltage, whereas uh, in modulation method 1, we saw that there is high frequency in uh, the common mode input. So, you might uh, need more EMI filtering. So, you could actually now uh, uh, on an overall system basis, look at uh, what it takes to actually uh, do a comparison. Now, we have looked at uh, essentially single phase, uh, two options for single phase power conversion, but we could see that even in this simple example, uh, we could do a very uh, exhaustive analysis of uh, what the implications of each design choice is. So, uh, to take this further, we uh, 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 more detailed analysis, we need to actually look at what the implications are uh, when you are looking at it closely from a semiconductor perspective and also from a AC uh, filter design perspective, which we will discuss uh, later. Thank you.